Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMagan with the Mises Institute, and with me is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And it's 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 me and Tho this week talking about the election, which apparently is next week. Uh, and it's it's such big news, even I know that it's next week. And uh, we're going to talk about, like, what are we going to do when candidate X wins? Um, I, I'm not willing to bet my life savings on any particular outcome at this point. But I think uh, there are two different strategies I think we'll need to employ depending on who wins and just, the re the, just what is the political reality, what is the ideological reality, what should our reaction be depending on who wins. We'll talk about that a little bit today. Real quick, though, though, we've got a couple of events coming up, right? Um, well, a couple in Florida, actually. Yeah, our, uh, we are finishing the year with our event in Fort Myers on November 9th, Elections in the Economy. Do they really matter? We talk about political fallout on the, on the bottom line there. Uh, we've got a great group of speakers. We have Mises Institute President Tom DeLorenzo. We've got the great Mark Thornton, Wanjiro Najoya, and our good friend Murray Sabrin, um, who's bringing us down there to Fort Myers. It's going to be a great event. Unfortunately, I myself will not be there. My wife and I are expecting our second shortly thereafter, so I'm in the no-fly zone. But I will be at our first event for 2025, and that will be a little bit down the road in beautiful Tampa, Florida, thanks to the Schrader family down there. The topic is Educating for Liberty. Um, it's a Mesa Circle at um, February 22nd in beautiful Tampa. Always a great time down there. We've got a great, great group building up there. So if you're in the South Florida area and you can make uh, either of those, both is even better, check out those at Mises.org slash events. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll know who wins uh, at Hopefully. that event. Well, hope, I mean, who knows? Maybe who knows? they can draw it out for months <laughs> afterward. I guess even in 2000, uh, we didn't really know no. who the winner was until late November. Yeah. Uh, something like that. So, yeah, who knows what could happen? Who knows what the regime has in store for us? Uh, I learned during COVID, uh, predict nothing, put nothing is off the table. Uh, and that's certainly true with this election. But I think I want to answer the question of, OK, what do you do when candidate X wins? And so we'll just kind of start off with, OK, what are you going to do when Kamala wins? Uh, now, I've, I've had an article in my head for months um, called, what are you going to do when Kamala wins? Now, it's, it's the title shifted to, what are you going to do if Kamala wins? Uh, I, I fully expected her to win like six months ago. Uh, it looks like Trump's building. Uh, enough momentum here. However, that, hey, they could still cheat. I mean, anecdotal evidence everywhere is that, look, they're trying to suppress uh, turnout in Republican areas. Uh, they're, of course, not checking any ID or anything in Democrat areas. They're, and just the news about cheating from 2020 just comes out more and more and more. And as Connor O'Keefe noted, right, this whole claim about, well, there's no evidence of widespread cheating. That's, that's, their, that's their key adjective, right? But as Connor noted, well, of course, if you're going to cheat, you're going to do targeted cheating to the places where it would make a difference. You're not just going to, like, flood the U.S. evenly with fake ballots or whatever. That's stupid. Uh, so there's never going to be widespread evidence of cheating. There's going to be very targeted cheating. And uh, who, really? Who, who isn't just... Uh, full on a sympathetic backer of the regime thinks that there, there isn't cheating that's going to take place. There's trillions of dollars at stake. Of course, cheating throughout American history is well documented, but somehow we've cleaned it all up and it's the most secure election in the world. Um, I mean, I guess if you want to believe that stuff, uh, I wish you well. Uh, but it just doesn't reflect reality in, in the world. So what do you do when Kamala wins? Might be able to pull it out. Uh, and who knows? Maybe there's actually even enough Kamala supporters out there who like her and they turn out at the last minute. Uh, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that 80% of America wants lower taxes, more freedom, free speech, and uh, agrees with uh, <laughs> our, our traditionalist uh, way of life. By traditionalist, I mean, right, just normal people getting married, having children, wanting to be left the hell alone. I don't think uh, an overwhelming majority of Americans think that or believe in that at the moment. So it's not beyond the pale that Kamala could get a majority 
of votes. I'm not delusional enough to think that everybody agrees with me. Uh, so what do we do when when she wins? Then I, I, I kind of the the thing I see though, and I continue to get it from our readers. Obviously, not our more devoted readers, but people who kind of are in the the general vicinity of the Mises Institute. You wouldn't believe how many emails I get who who continue to just say the same thing year after year. If we just get back to Reagan era values, if we just follow the Constitution, everything will be fine. Well, we'll vote next time. Next time we'll 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 get them next time. Well, okay, and, and what damage are they going to do in the next four years while we're all talking about how they just need to get back to the Constitution? And by the way, we should note all this. If we just get back to the Constitution, what can we do? That's purely constitutional, even according to the old text of the Constitution. Let's see. We can get rid of the filibuster. We can pack the Supreme Court completely constitutional. We can ensure that uh, the Supreme Court is, I don't know, there are six Trump people on there now. Let's just add another six people to the court uh, under Kamala. Well, guess what? Now, whatever, whatever those judges say is constitutional is constitutional now. That's how the Constitution works. Uh, ever since John Marshall invented the idea of judicial review. So, okay, we're following the Constitution now. And guess what? Kamala and her friends can ram through whatever they want with 51 votes in Congress or with 51 votes in the Senate with a majority in the Congress, and it'll all get approved by their stacked Supreme Court. All purely constitutional. So is that your plan? Is that your plan to, to, to win over freedom for America? Um, Although, though, I bet you know some people who actually say that's what we got to do. Just just wait another four years. We'll, we'll run a better candidate then and we'll just get the right people in there. Right. I mean, that's going to be the go to line immediately afterwards. Should you get that outcome? It's going to oh, if the Republicans ran anybody but Trump, then this would have been a blowout, yada, yada, yada. And, and of, of course, any Republican that was put up there. Uh, you know, against Kamala would have gotten the same sort of, you know, Nazi attacks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's like, particularly if it was, you know, may, maybe Nikki Haley would have adjusted a little bit of the media discourse around the Republican uh, nominee in that race. But then you have Nikki Haley, who is, you know, not that much different than Kamala Harris on, on the, the important things that matter here. Um, and, but what, of course, what's interesting is that a lot of the people, and not necessarily our crowd, right? You know, you, you do have a lot of the more more hardline folks that, you know, when they talk about the Constitution, they see it as a device to try to rain down the state, um, you know, kind of taking kind of that, the Jeffersonian sort of strategy for, for what happened after, after the coup, right? But when a lot of people talk about, you know, let's just get back to the Constitution, what they really mean is a sort of nostalgic sort of return to institutional norms. And the reality is it doesn't matter who wins, institutional norms are coming down because institutional norms have, have created a system that is inoperable right now. And what's interesting is that, you know, beyond whichever candidate wins, right, I think we can recognize based off of the rhetoric, based off the discourse, based off of conversations that, you know, if, if you have any now with people that don't, um, that, are, that are in a, a different tribe, or, you know, if you're part of neither tribe in the way that you vote, then, you know, having conversations with either, either one of them, is that we are fundamentally in a post-election society, right? Both sides are not going to believe the legitimacy of whoever wins this race. And so if a Kamala victory in particular, based off of what we can tell right now, uh, based off of early voting data versus off of polling trends and things like that, the most likely outcome from a Kamala victory, which is kind of ground one on the fallout from that, is we're probably looking at a, 20, a 270 to 268 map. Nevada Republicans have a very, very high early voting percentage, traditional blue state. You add that to the corner, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, you know, what they call the Sun Belt there. Um, you have that kind of interesting little swing district in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, which looks to be reliably blue. You've got the one little swing district in Maine that looks like it's voting Trump the way it has last couple times. So it gives you to math 270 to 268. And golly gosh darn, you can bet that election outcome sure is going to uh, unite the country. It's going to lead to a very, very peaceful situation afterwards. And so before anything else is done, that is the political environment we inherit. If, if you have a Kamala victory come next Tuesday, most likely based off of what we know right now. Yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, for those of us who wish to undermine the status quo, you want that division. You want those questions about who really won. 
uh, because these national elections are just a joke, right? They're just so huge. There's so many moving parts. There's now that the whole system is so federalized, there's so little local self-government without constant federal meddling. There's just so many armies of federal regulators that the stakes are so high. You, all you do is want to mind your business in state X in the middle of the country, but there's, there's federal control of everything now. And so now who wins the presidency is is hugely determinant of just how you can now live your your daily life. So people, of course, have good reason to doubt. They have good reason to hate the outcome and they have good reason to be suspicious that, OK, well, this was an extremely close election. What if there had just been what if the media had not propagandized this point so much? What if there hadn't been cheating in this particular state? Then what would the outcome have been? And uh, so that's all. That's a benefit of these close elections is there is no consensus. There is no unity. And that is the last thing we want right now, because the country isn't in reality unified. Uh, people in your people in your blue states hate people in your red states like like hate them. Uh, of course, Biden called Trump supporters garbage the other day, tried to then uh, backpedal on that. This, of course, goes back eight years to when Hillary was saying that half the country are deplorables. They're just horrible, awful people. That is how uh, at least a third of the country feels about a third of the rest of the country. Yeah, there's probably like a third in the middle that's kind of less, they have less uh, animated feelings about it. But I know that there are tons of people in northeastern United States or in California who consider my way of life, which is a normal Christian uh, nuclear family, raise your children, mind your own business way of life, they find that despicable. They think I'm despicable. They think my way of life is despicable. So why would I want to be in a country with those people? I don't want to be forced to live side by side with you. I don't want unity. I want separation. And so, of course, we want these sorts of close contests to really highlight just how it really is about 50.1 percent of the country ruling with an iron fist over the other side. And, and that's where um, I get it. What will be interesting in this scenario is what happens to the Republican Party, because there's two paths they can go down. Right. You know, the, the D.C. You know, conservative Inc., you know, a lot of the power brokers, you know, the, the Karl Rove's, like, you know, particularly anyone from you know, pre-2016 Republican Party and a lot of powerful folks there. Right. They're going to blame Trump for losing what should be a gimme, right, given just how unpopular Biden is, given everything out there, you know, they're, they're going to say, oh, well, if only, again, as we mentioned earlier, if only we had a more Reaganist candidate, then the Republican Party would be perfectly fine. So the problem is the MAGA folks, the problem is these people that have been, you know, nominating these nut jobs for, you know, Senate races and things like that. And that is the, pro the, the problem that the party has. And so for us to, to start winning elections again, we've got to become, you know, we, we've got to smarten up and we've got to become the adults in the room, right? That's be one path that the party can take, you know, more Nikki Haley, less Donald Trump. The other side of it, which I think is, is given the makeup of the base, given that this is not simply a top down, right? It's, it's not simply Trump dragging alongside a Republican electorate, but that the overwhelming majority of that electorate really does you know, believe in uh, this, this very sort of disruptive, you know, they, they think the political status quo is corrupt. They, they, you know, there's been a massive swing in the way that actual Republican voter views their relationship with DC. Then four years, yeah, there, there'll be conversations about what happens four years from now. But the question is how much of that energy, how much of that distrust can then be pushed into the state model of creating bulwarks of resistance against Kamala. Because you know, one of the arguments out there, right, you've seen a very respectable publications, I think the National Review, of course, ran an article along these lines, right, is that, oh, well, Kamala can't be that bad. It's a low stakes election because chances are, and this is true, chances are that even in that situation, right, where Kamala wins, chances are overwhelmingly Republicans take the Senate. In that situation, it's probably gonna be a thin majority, right? So, you know, they win West Virginia, um, but they lose Arizona. Or you're, you're, you're going to lose the swing states, but you get West Virginia. That flips one right there. You probably win Montana. That flips one right there. And so you're looking at a very narrow Republican Senate. In that situation, you probably have Democrats winning the House. Um, you know, so that you, know, so you, you probably have Kamala inheriting the House in that political environment. Um, but that's even up in the air. Um, but if it's 
Kamala, Democrat Senate or Democrat House and a very small marginal Republican Senate, you know, then you're still dealing with moderates like Suzanne or like uh, yeah, Susan Harris from Maine. You're dealing with Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, right? And so on those issues that require 50 votes, chances are there's going to be the opportunity there for Kamala to get a lot of what she wants um, in those things. Now, because a lot of stuff has to get 60, 60 votes there. Um, so there'll be a little bit of, 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 you know, a little bit of stagnation there, a little bit of divided government uh, creating some issues there. Of course, it has nothing to do with the regulatory state, nothing that, you know, the, the very robust powers the executive branch have. Yeah, that's still there. The, you know, I, I bet you're, you're going to see even a further left would push of the officials that make up those institutions under that time of round. And so can hopefully the, the recognition there would be that the only practical political response is to enhance, strengthen, and embolden the, the sort of state-driven Republican leadership where some of the biggest you know, conservative victories, you know, whether or not we agree with them or not, right, the, the, the victories that have been the biggest ones um, against what the, particularly the Biden administration has wanted, has come from state-level action. And so that does create an opportunity for greater organization at the state level, to a certain extent at the local level, of trying to create these areas of resistance against whatever the regime wants to do. And that creates, I think, a great opportunity for people who, you know, who recognize the unsolvable nature of federal politics, um, and, you know, kind of going right back into the fire right there, kind of keeps that energy up. Because you know, on the other side is that you know, if you don't have president as the boogeyman, some of those muscles are obviously not going to be used as much as they otherwise would. And so that is one of the advantages there is that that, that fundamental distrust, that, that, um, that, uh, that tension between red state governments and D.C. will only further grow should you get a Kamala, a Kamala victory. Yeah, I agree. You need a base of opposition outside Washington, D.C., and I think that only gets um, all the more encouraged when you start to get to the point where you think, oh, by the way, if Kamala wins, then then you're thinking, well, I, I don't see how a reform Republican, and reform in a good way, someone who actually doesn't want the status quo or the status quo of minus five years, right? That that illustrates how useless like National Review people are, right? They're, they're complacent with the idea that, oh, well, things will be okay because we'll still have a slight majority in the Senate. Yeah, the <laughs> sure, the House, the presidency, that all be Dems, and they'll all be pushing to move hard left. But don't worry, we'll be able to slow things down slightly with the Senate. This is how your mainstream conservatives think, right? If we could just slow down all the horrible things the other side is doing, then, then that's fine. That's the most we can ask right. for. And then, of course, their absolute ideal situation, what they really, if they, were to, if they could do whatever they wanted, their ideal is whatever was going on 20 years ago. That's always your conservative position, yeah. right? Whatever was ideal was what would ever happening 20 years ago. These people are completely lacking in historical knowledge, imagination, any real attempt to change the ideological realities of the United States. They just want to go back to what was going on 20 years ago, and that's the best that they think anybody should even aspire to. So forget these people. Um, and National Review has exposed for us what what their thinking is. So just slow things down slightly and maybe go back to, I don't know, George W. Bush days. That'll be great. That's that's it. And of course, where we are now is thanks to George W. Bush. He was part of the problem, very much so. But that, I guess that's that's the National Review's goal right now. Uh, so, well, well, and of course, when, when, when other, of course, if we look even outside of that, right, if we look at some of the, the decisions coming up that you know very well could affect you know some of these other sort of you know, institutions within D.C., uh, you know, the Supreme Court comes, you know, it, it suddenly comes to the, the forefront there as well, right? You've got Clarence Thomas, you've got uh, Alito, who are getting up there in age. Uh, John Roberts uh, is, you know, going to be in his 70s during that Kamala, you know, you know in, in the next four years, um, you know, I think he's, he's turned 70 next year. And so that's another aspect where kind of the fallout in terms of in, in uh, the, the blowback to other institutions that, again, you know, <laughs> Again, you know, that's that's kind of, again, this, this whole idea, you know, the assumption that, you know, the status quo is better than radical change one way or another, um, which kind of is that 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 national review mindset. Right. You know, some of those some of those assumptions can change quite rapidly, um, you know, particularly given every all the chaos that we've seen um, in the last, uh, you know, last 10 years. Well, and I think this then starts to bring us back toward the, the toward our second topic, which is, OK, what do you do if Trump wins? If in either case, no matter who wins. You want to undermine the system. 
in in neither case am I going to start saying, oh, well, things are fixed now, folks. Uh, we're, we're back moving the right direction. What we need now is unity. I saw Vivek uh, Ramaswamy. He was on some show. I didn't watch the show, but it was the, the clip was on Twitter. And I watched that, and he was talking about election reform. And he was saying that one of the purposes of election reform should be to restore faith in the system, to restore faith in the government. And that is the last thing we want. We do not want restoring faith in the system. We don't want restoring faith in the government. This is, what, this is one of Lou Rockwell's great observations is how great Watergate was because it really, really undermined faith in the American political system. And then that was disastrous because a big part of the Reagan agenda was to restore faith in American government. And that was that is absolutely not, anyone who loves freedom would never want to restore faith in the federal government. Uh, but that's, of course, naturally what you hear out of Washington all the time and people who have a stake in gaining power through the federal um, political system is we need to restore faith in government. And no, we want, we want to agitate. We want uh, significant radical change. We do not want to go back to five years ago. We do not want um, just to slow down the damage being done. We want to dismantle the federal government. And uh, so no matter who wins, that needs to be the relentless and ongoing goal. However, what to do in terms of what, what happens when Trump wins, we're going to hear, and I've been through so many cycles now at this point, uh, that I know how it works. Uh, even though I didn't work for the Mises Institute back when George W. Bush was president, I certainly saw this then, was we need to support whatever horrible policies Republican candidate X favors because if we don't support everything they do, they might get voted out of office. So then, of course, you're totally neutralized and you're just giving whatever the most powerful lobbies within the party want because they, of course, will then dictate the narrative if you refuse to criticize the, uh, the, the candidate or the, the winning Republican uh, person, president. Uh, I mean, this applies to all levels of government. And I just always remember the case of George W. Bush when he was running for re-election, this was in about, about a year, he wanted the largest increase in the welfare state that had happened since LBJ. And this was the addition of Medicare Part D. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to funnel huge amounts of new welfare money to the elderly. So they'd vote for him. But good political strategy absolutely made him really expose him as the enemy of freedom that he was and has always been. Uh, but I remember he sent his legions out, his minions out, to tell us all, shut up, don't criticize this, we have to massively expand welfare or else George W. Bush might lose. As if the current history today would be significantly different if John Kerry had, had won in 2004. As if current history would be significantly different if John McCain had won in 2008. Uh, which, by the way, I should note, right, if you were a Ron Paul supporter back in 2008, you heard exactly all the time what you were saying, though, is we need to get the adults in the room. We need to, we need to elect these, uh, these compromised candidates who are going to work within the system. All these, these attempts at radical change, they won't work. They wanted John McCain. John McCain, <laughs> right, we all saw John, how John McCain behaved, especially in the later years of his career, was that he was indistinguishable from an Obama ally. Uh, just absolutely no different. And so that was who we were told we needed to vote for in order to get a, a very different America. Complete nonsense. But we're going to be hearing in the coming days uh, after Trump gets elected is, okay, now we just need to let him work. Don't, don't, uh, don't criticize him. Let, uh, help him pass all of his stuff. Because if you criticize him, that just helps the other guy. And all that does then is neutralize actual opposition to the regime and then enable Trump to do all of his worst stuff. I'm sure after he appoints guys like Pompeo, who he was speaking well of the other day, all of his people who are maybe marginally slightly less bad than John Bolton, but still awful, were supposed to then just roll over and support all of this stuff. That's what I'm going to be hearing a lot from from uh, our our readers who aren't actual libertarians, but uh, kind of stumble upon our site. They're going to be telling me all day, you need to tr support Trump. Don't criticize his tax increases, because, of course, an increase to a tariff is nothing more than a tax increase. Tax increases are good now. Don't you understand? Deficit spending is good now if Trump does it. And I'm going to be hearing a lot of that if Trump wins. You know, I think the outcomes here, they get a lot more interesting with with a, a Trump path. For one, like just the path themselves are, are very interesting. Is for one, you know, what are the aspects of the election, right? Is that, you know, we have seen, we've never seen a more uh, a robust 
calculated, uh, organized regime attack on a single political figure quite like Trump, you know, from the, the way that media has framed stuff, from the way that, you know, everyone ranging from Mitch McConnell to, you know, the rank and file Democrats, ranging from, you know, retired generals and intelligence officers and, you know, former you know, Trump staffers and things like that, right? All of them basically saying this guy is, is, is a Nazi, this guy's untouchable, this guy is, you know, deplorable, yada, 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 right? You know, there's, there's never been such a cohesive, such a, a, such a well-organized effort to stop one single political candidate from really becoming just normalized within the political discourse and all of this for, you know, what is essentially a 90s era Democrat. And so that's where, you know, if we start just from potential election outcomes, they range from, once again, that a, a, another very narrow sort of victory there, right? You know, maybe Trump takes, you know, one of the other swing states outside the, the Sun Belt, um, you know, ranging from, you know, New Hampshire to, uh, to you know, just it, Pennsylvania as, as a, you know, breaking away from everyone else, or maybe it's just Wisconsin, right? So you could have any, anything ranging from a relatively small uh, electoral college margin victory, something smaller than 2016, ranging to an electoral college victory that is larger than 2016. If you just include the Rust Belt states that he won 2016 plus Nevada, as I mentioned earlier, that would be a higher electoral vote total. And then, you know, within the realm of possibility based off of national polling is the potential for even Trump winning the popular vote. Now, again, we talk about the politics of that here in a second, the policy ramifications of that in a second. But, you know, just from the get go, what, what that would do in terms of, of delegitimizing all these institutions, showing that it basically Americans are, are actually are willing to you know, throw their middle finger up to completely disregard. It'd be the complete breakdown of the, the power of the mainstream media to to create that sort of uh, manufactured uh, consent. Um, Connor O'Keefe had a great article on this uh, on the wire uh, uh, today. Um, that that itself, right? That that is one victory right from the get-go that comes from an election similar to how a 27, or 270, 268 Kamala victory has a an element of victory in it, just because it will create this massive chaos in the perception of the entire process. And so, what comes next, though? is again you know what exactly are we going to get from trump is it going to be a essentially a repeat of 2016 right you bring in a lot of those adults in the room um you know you, you have um you know would not expect spending to go down right to any significant degree i know there's at least lip service paid it's like oh we're gonna have elon musk come in and learn how to like efficiently run an organization yeah, again, I, I would not be expecting that, right? You know, these these institutions, these organ, these these departments, all of that, they are very good at surviving. Um, you know, the idea that there's going to be enough political capital that Trump has to do any sort of major systemic reform, even if he wanted to, right? He's not going to have 60 votes in the Senate. Um, there's going to be some stuff that can come from uh, 50 votes. There's going to be some stuff from executive orders. But the idea that there's going to be to walk in with the political capital, completely reorganize the system the way that some aspirational people hope they're like the idea that we're going to replace income taxes with a tariff, right? You know, we can have a second conversation about what's worth income taxes or tariffs. Um, and you've written some articles on that. But if spending doesn't go down, then the idea, then that entire idea just doesn't make sense, right? You know, you, you have to have a some massive reduction of spending to have anything that resembles an actual drop in a, 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 a legitimate drop in what Americans are being stolen from. And so whether that comes in the form of inflation, whether that comes in the form of income taxation, whether that comes in the form of a tariff, you know, that's still the burden, the financial burden that the government is placing on the rest of the country. It just kind of just changes in the way that operates from here and there. And so, you know, we know that Trump likes to spend. We, he's already proposed a variety of additional policies ranging from, you know, including IVF to, you know, Obamacare mandates, all sorts of stuff. He's never been someone interested in, in doing um, entitlement reform, which, you know, not not politically popular anyway, right out there because we are a nation that uh, you know loves loves our free goodies, and so you know what is interesting is two things in my opinion. One is what does it mean for the future of the Republican Party as this sort of interesting uh, political organization of you know interesting figures, right? We we have seen again right, ranging from. You know the Elon Musk Silicon Valley tech bro wing that has joined on board. Um, we've seen more libertarians kind of dabbling with Trump this time around than even 2016. Uh, J.D. Vance, you know, for for bad ideas that he has, he's an interesting figure relative to particularly Mike Pence, but other Republicans. 
what does that, you know, what is actually winning the White House? What does actually having power for four years and, and just that lame duck aspect is also quite fascinating of someone winning an election and not having to think about a second term. Um, what does that ends up translating to in terms of, you know, something resembling a vision long term for what this Trump movement creates? The other side of it is, uh, you know, what are the little areas of breathing room where you know, this, this entire campaign aesthetic, right, this, this, this activating, you know, you can't trust the FBI, you know, you, you can't trust DC, drain the swamp, whatever. Again, we know DC is not going to be hurting for money, but what are those little holes that possibly could be punched, right? I think one of the interesting aspects of kind of when Trump talks about taxes, right, you have standard fare about, you know, cutting corporate tax rates, et cetera, et cetera. But he's really focused on creating more tax loopholes, right? You know, no tax on tips, no tax on you know, social security benefits, no tax on, uh, I, th I think he talked about, you know, veterans and police officers and whatever, you know, various government employees, things like that. You know, that, that's not, you know, that's kind of a different sort of reform of creating these little loopholes where you could have some interesting stuff happen on the margins to kind of create some, some breathing room. Um, you know, I had an article last week about um, kind of interesting um, growth in Fed skepticism um, of you know, members of Congress. We've seen the Bitcoin lobby get very active this political cycle. We even saw J.D. Vance even say, you know, like, I'm not a Ron Paul guy, and he's definitely not a libertarian, right? So you know, he's, he's, he's at least admitting that. He's not trying to pander. I'm not a Ron Paul guy, but I think that some of the Fed, some of the Fed criticism, particularly the extent to which uh, kind of low interest rates, cheap debt benefits corporations at the expense of, of Main Street, like these are some good arguments, you know, understanding the financialization consequences that you've written about, that the Institute has, has, has written about for years. And so just having some of those lights go on, you know, is there a way of, you know, for example, limiting the capital gains taxes on gold, silver, and Bitcoin, right? You know, that's not going to end the Fed. That's not going to, to solve anything in a systemic way, but it would create a little hole, it would create a little loophole um, that would make it easier for people to save. And so again, those are very, very high aspirational things that can be done kind of within the margins there. Um, at the very least, you know, it's, you know, what can be done in the, kind of the middle ground is what can be done to direct a lot of the energy that is motivating the people that are turning out for Trump and towards more uh, anti-DC, more effective anti-DC ways. Or is Trump just going to come in? It's going to be even worse in 2016. You're going to have all this energy built up and kind of put into, you know, kind of become captured Right, we're, are we going to get even worse? You know, are we going to get the tariffs and no good policy? Right? Are we going to, uh, you know, simply have a continuation of our foreign policy with Iran? You know, in, in particular, you know, maybe maybe the uh, conflicts in you know with Russia and Ukraine die down, but we're going to see escalation in support for um, Israel and their actions in the Middle East. Right? So, so everything can range here from, you know, worse than 2016, 2016, and what comes after or some small efforts on the margin that can provide a little bit of breathing room for whatever comes next four years from now. Because again, even if Trump wins, and even if Trump wins the popular vote, the, you know, the regime is not going to take standing down, being humiliated like that. So you know, all, all the different stresses, all the, the outside tensions, all of the escalation that we saw that kind of marked the 2016, 2020 era of you know, media hysterica, of lawfare, of you know violence in the streets of that sort of stuff, very good reason to expect that again. Um, so so you know how how is that going to translate into something that is is meaningful rather than simply oh well Trump won and nothing comes out of it, kind of like almost it's a very similar way the same way that you know so much energy was put into Brexit in 2016 and like you look at the UK today is the UK better now than it was you know after Brexit you know, when, when Brexit passed like it's good that people are fleeing the European Union but in terms of quality of life for the people that support it uh, all the arguments used to support it has that actually paid off in the practice probably not so I think that is kind of you know where where the, the you know the, the realm of opportunities lie when it comes to a second Trump term yeah, it was amazing the extent to which the UK regime uh, was able to neutralize the whole Brexit thing was that Brexit occurred in name, um, but no real significant gains there in terms of asserting any real distance from the EU. And of course, the EU is just used it as a way to screw over British people, removing English as an official language uh, <laughs> at the at the <laughs> EU and a variety of other just petty changes designed to uh, give a screw you to uh, to the English, stuff like that. And yeah, what came of it? Uh, certainly no sea change of any kind in uh, European 
uh, politics. And you could see that happening here as well. Because, of course, Trump isn't running for re-election. And so if everything you should, you're should you doing should be in terms of thinking about 2028, which is going to be an open seat. So if everything you're doing is to just make Trump look good, to tie your movement to Trump the man, you are going nowhere. You are not creating any sort of midterm or long-term uh, strategy that could possibly improve the situation. All you're doing is putting everything into this basket of this one politician who and who isn't going to make substantial changes. It's great that it's a humiliation of the regime. It's great that, the, that they hate Trump and that the voters can show their dissatisfaction by electing Trump. But the national debt is going to go up to, I don't know, 45 trillion uh, <laughs> by the end, f at least 40 trillion by the tri time Trump is done. And how much are we going to be paying then in monthly interest on the debt? How much is the Fed going to be have to inter have to intervene monetizing the debt to keep interest rates down at a reasonable level so that the Treasury's um, sovereign debt situation doesn't just explode? If you think Trump's going to do anything really about monetary inflation, about price inflation, you're just really not accepting reality. There's nothing that's going to change here. And as we can see here in the fact that uh, Trump talks all the time about reducing taxes, but never, ever, ever about reducing spending. And so if you're driving up higher deficits, what does that mean? It actually means more taxation for you in terms of the inflation tax. It means more power uh, for the central bank, because the central bank will become all the more indispensable to the treasury, which will need uh, a partner in dealing with ever larger and crushing amounts of federal debt. So if, if they're talking about skepticism about the central bank, but at the same time running huge deficits, what it means is their preferred option is to double down on the Fed. You can't be skeptical of the Fed and also run huge deficits, which you need the Fed to help launder essentially. So we can't really believe what they're saying until they start talking about big, uh, significant reductions in spending. And, and that is a, a profoundly different world that Trump is inheriting in 2024 than he inherited in 2016, right? Because you, you did have, um, you interest rates were, were able to stay as low as they were because we didn't have the global expansion of debt. Um, and, and of course, you know, we, we can already kind of kind of game plan out, you know, what Trump's going to do, right? Trump's going to browbeat the Fed to lower rates, right? You know, that's been one of his consistent talking points is, you know, oh, well, you know, interest rates were down when I was in charge. And again, like, you know, we're in a different world like you, you, because, you know, everything blew up during COVID because, you know, by bipartisan agreement on blowing the, up the budget um, during COVID, just radical World War II level spending, that the idea that, okay, you're going to get back to, you know, 2017 interest rates, um, you know, we, we, we saw it play out when in 2018, where the real economy was actually rising. Some of the deregulatory de policies were actually helping. Some of the tax cuts, you know, were helping. You actually saw genuine economic growth the way that you did not see during the Obama years. And of course, Trump goes out there and Brow beats Powell for considering raising interest rates. And he had to pivot and whatever. Um, and so that, that, that landscape of not being able to get um, you know, not being able to spend, you know, that, that the, the, the stake of the, the, the cost on the debt is not going to go back to 2016 levels. It's going to create a whole lot of tensions. It's going to create a whole lot of issues if, they, if, if Trump simply tries to replicate what happened the first time around. And what's also interesting is that there, there is a, an additional global dynamic here, right, where, you know, if we you know, talk, look at the international relationship side of things, I, I, I think one of the things that you could expect from a, a Trump world, it'd be interesting to see how it plays out elsewhere, is further escalation between the EU and America. Um, the fact that EU is going after Elon and Elon's behind Trump and, you know, we can talk about Ukraine and that sort of stuff. These additional global dynamics, again, it's, it's a very different world that Trump will be taking over in 2025 should he win than he did in 2016. And, you know, if, if the, there's going to be a lot of a lot of push like, oh, we'll just just kind of use the same playbook. Things things felt good then. Um, ignore the underlying rotten decay that, uh, you know, that the economy has been dealing with for, for quite some time. You know, it's, it's going to be a very different world and how he how he responds to these additional pressures, some of which are the direct results of his spending policies last time around. You know, that is going to be, I think, one of the most fascinating to see, things to see is exactly what path, you know, is, is that administration going to to look at for dealing with things that he cannot control 
and you know you get fed independence even you know, the, the the myth of fed independence um you know and there's an interesting article by just Lerner kind of making the case that you know that's that's explicitly taken away but i think that's going to be one of those areas when it comes to to monetary policy of the of trump really being very explicit in trying to order the fed what to do uh, i think that's gonna be one of the very interesting things just to see play out um the next four years when he's having to deal with against some of the the consequences of spending and debt that he did not have to fully uh, uh, you know, deal with the first time around and so what to do if Trump wins, right? Well, obviously what not to do is to, to, to act like things are fine now. And uh, we done. should work. We've yeah. won. <laughs> Victor, mission should, accomplished. I mean, now the, the, the good guys are in charge. We should work for unity. We should rebuild trust in the federal government. That's absolutely the worst idea ever. Never do that. Uh, I always just think of the words of, um, uh, it was a he was an abolitionist uh, who worked uh, during the war and it was after the war and of course there had been abolition of slavery and all this stuff and one of the young guys went to one of these older abolitionists he said what do i do now and the old man said agitate 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 this is absolutely what we should always be doing always undermine the regime always speak badly of the people in washington always call for more separation secession should absolutely be on everybody's lips um, whether in whether it's formal recession, uh, secession or just efforts to disempower the federal government working at the state and local levels. Um, encourage mockery of the federal government, encourage contempt for federal officials, encourage legislation at the state level where states refuse to enforce uh, federal legislation of any kind. This should always be our goal no matter who wins. And the fact that Trump wants, well, get, so he's going to be gone in four years, and then what? The, trust me, the, the old establishment GOP is going to regroup, and they're going to start running people like Nikki Haley, and they're going to attempt to uh, compromise and win over Vivek to get him to be more friendly toward them. So as you just go right back then to what uh, Tom Woods would say, no matter who you vote for, you just end up with John McCain. This is, uh, this is going to be their strategy. And, and, I, and I think so, you know, in either side of things, right, the desire for greater tension between the states and the feds um, is, is a long term, you know, is, is a constant. One of the things that obviously is, a, is an interesting dynamic if Trump does win is that that tension is going to come from blue states. And what we've seen is that blue states are a lot more um, willing to engage in forms of nullification and state organized pushback then for the most part we've seen with, a, with very few exceptions from red states so that's another aspect where you know, driving california crazy driving um you know washington crazy driving colorado crazy right that's a, that's a positive aspect that's one of the interesting things actually um uh, four years ago right when they were having all these reports the new york times the washington post both reported on kind of war game scenarios going into election day in 2020 you had john podesta who was actively, you know, kind of wargaming out a scenario where it was a very narrow Trump victory. And part of that strategy was having blue states threaten to secede if, you know, claiming voter suppression and threatening to secede um, as a Democrat political response to a Trump victory. So, you know, what are those cards on the table in that sort of environment? I think that's where, again, some of these, again, we've, just because we've seen a lot more will, we've seen a lot more backbone from Democrat leaders on that dynamic that we've seen from the majority of Republican leaders, that aspect of, of, of uh, you know, tension between states and DC gets, I think, even more interesting with the Trump administration than with you know, Republicans that are just gonna be you know, perfectly happy to you know, take whatever uh, you know, federal, uh, federal level subsidies that are willing to be pushed down um, at the state level and just you know, they'll take, take the little bit and just be quiet for the most part. Um, that's another aspect of it where that, again, that, that tension between states and the feds gets a lot more interesting in a Trump dynamic. And then, of course, just on a personal level, what should you do? Well, we talked about this at our Albuquerque meeting uh, with the Mises Institute. You should be building up non-state institutions. That's always what you should be doing, no matter who wins. You should be building up your family, your business, your church, and your local municipal organizations, your community organizations that like uh, a state government that can offer a counterbalance to the feds. What you need are uh, people centered around local concerns, local communities that have interests separate from Washington and which can make those interests be felt 
in some way. And you should absolutely, on a personal level, not be doing what Laura Loomer recommends. I know, I know, though, you mentioned you have another baby on the way. You apparently are not taking advice from Laura Loomer, who a few weeks ago was talking, she was, you know, just being hysterical. This woman strikes me as unstable. And uh, she's a cat lady for Trump, um, where uh, she, she apparently has nothing going on except political activism because she w went on this rant talking about how if uh, wait until the election, until you know that Trump wins, do not have children, do not buy a house, do not build a business because if Kamala wins, it's all just over and the world is going to come crumbling down. So don't do anything. Just just give up. Sterilize yourself was the natural conclusion you come to based on Laura Loomer's uh, opinion, because if the if Kamala wins, the world is too horrible to raise children in. Um, which I guess tells me that Laura Loomer knows absolutely nothing about human history prior to, I don't know, last year. And so, yeah, do not, do not listen to these hysterics who are telling you that if, if Trump loses and Kamala wins, that it's all over, that life's too terrible now, that don't even bother, just give up, just start playing video games all day, and just uh, make sure that uh, you, you, you never have a family and you never actually contribute anything to society, because what's the point? It's all terrible now. Uh, that sort of thinking is pure poison, and it makes me think someone like Laura Loomer is like a plant from the left or something. Uh, so don't listen to those people, that's for sure. You keep living your life, keep doing things, uh, keep building up a society that the state hates. And then I think one of the areas where there's a lot of opportunity, um, and that is, again, if you just think about you know, buying four years of space, I think building up, um, you know, particularly on the educational side of things, you know, building up stronger home, um, homeschooling organizations, building up more micro schools. Um, you know, there's, we've already seen some good, good uh, traction in Arizona. We've seen some stuff in Florida. Um, I think we're going to see more of that level, that state level um, legislation coming through. And, you know, eventually there's going to be a reckoning, you know, next time there's a Democrat in office. So, again, you know, there's going to be a, a, a big push to crack down on non-public schooling um, and trying to use every level that the federal government has on that side of things, building up these institutions now so that they are harder to take away in the future. Um, and obviously with the, the education side of it, so important for, for everything. Um, that's one area in particular that I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity for, um, again, for, for building up those sort of institutions that you need that are, are pre-political, um, that, that can have lasting of effects, um, both for yourselves and for your community. And again, I think that's one of the areas where there's a, a huge level of opportunity, which is why I'm very excited for our event uh, in Febu February in Tampa that's going to be uh, ta talking about some of those issues. All right. Well, we better wrap up with that for this episode of Radio Rothbard. Uh, I guess the next time we meet, the election will have happened. So, uh, although we may not know the outcome, we may not so know. I, I don't know what we're going to do next we'll week. See what happens. Uh, <laughs> but we will be back next week with more. So, thank you for listening to Radio Rothbard, and we'll see you next time.